<clears throat> and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of her fornication. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. And the smoke of their torment is up forever and ever, that they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Before I get deep into the message, I think it's important whenever we have discussions about the word of God that we have some Bible baseline. I say Bible baseline because this is a baseline for having these talks and discussions based in the Bible. So the first thing we have to understand is that God doesn't change. And that's based in, it's, that's said in Malachi 3, 6, Psalms 92, and Hebrews 13, 8. So remember that God does not change. He is the same today, yesterday, and forever. Amen. The second thing we have to understand is God doesn't lie. That's found in Numbers 23, 19, and Titus 1, 4. Excuse me, 1, 2. Third, the Bible interprets the Bible. It's not up to us to read the Bible and then go off what we think or what we want to believe or what the Bible says. And if we don't understand a passage in the Bible, well, the Lord has blessed us with more in the Bible that we can go and compare it to, scripture upon scripture, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And we find that in Isaiah 28, 10, and 2 Peter 1, 20 through 21, which brings us to the conclusion of this situation of both God's character and Bible principles do not clash from Genesis to Revelation. They don't. So we're not going to be in the Bible and see one area where God says something and then we don't agree, we don't like it and say, well, look at this other area. He said something different. That's not going to happen. It's all consistent. It's all the same. The Bible against the Bible, we effectively calling God a liar and we already covered that God does not lie. So I like to always start with where we are in time. I do this, and, and there's a lot of things we can look at, but I do this with this particular subject that I'm about to show is because I think it's important we understand where we are in the timeline of the Earth's, of Earth's history. And when you understand that and keep that in your mind, you always walk around with a sense of urgency, a sense of urgency for living how Christ wants you to live, a sense of urgency for spreading the message that Christ wants you to spread. She says, we are living in the time of the end. The fast fulfilling signs of the times declare that the coming of Christ is near at hand. The days in which we live are solemn and important. The spirit of God is gradually but surely being withdrawn from the earth. Plagues and judgments are, around, are already falling upon the despises of, of the grace of God. The calamities by land and sea, the unsettled state of society, the alarms of war are pretentious. They forecast approaching events of the greatest magnitude. Even now he is at work in, in, in accidents and calamities by sea and by land, in great conflag conflagrations, in fierce tornadoes and terrific hailstorms and tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves and earthquakes, in every place and in a thousand forms. Satan is exercising his power. He sweeps away the ripening harvest and famine and distress follow. He imparts to the air a deadly taint and thousands perish by the pestilence. These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. Destruction... will be upon both man and beast. Sorry about that. There's a thing on her screen that blocks the bottom part of that screen, so I have to read it from there. And that comes from Testimonies, Volume 9, 11, 1, the first paragraph, and the second one is a great controversy, page 589.3. So let's look at this. State of emergency declared the recent tornadoes they had last month, 
18 tornadoes confirmed in Texas, 11 of those were in North Central Texas. It's just crazy what's happening. And, and I use the weather as, this, as just a real simple example because it's easy to look at and see. And when you start seeing things happen in the weather and you always see in the news, never happened before, first time in history, these kind of things should be waking us up. Cars and horses trapped overnight in a bridge amid historic Australian floods. So they have a flood that's made history. 70 degrees warmer than normal in eastern Antarctica. Scientists are flabbergasted. Dry January. Reno goes a month rain for the first time in nearly 130 years. I mean, these things happen and we just kind of, you know, maybe watch the news and kind of shrug it off. But it should be clicking in the back of our head. Western mega drought is worse in 1,200 years, intensified by climate change. The worst in 1,200 years. Recently, on the 27th of this month, Southern California had a historic drought. Lake Mead uh, fell to unprecedented lows. So there were things happening, and you know we don't dwell on these things and worry. We look at these things and rejoice because it's it's showing us the Bible prophecy is coming true that the Lord is soon coming. So these are signs we need to look for and look to and understand that we need to be ready. We need to help others be ready. So the angels are calling. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on earth, on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Now, in putting this together, I'll tell you, Strong's was my friend. I have a strong concordance. I hadn't used it much. And then when I started using it, the Lord opened up a whole new world for me in terms of understanding his word. So angel, we understand to be a messenger or angel or pastor. Flying in the midst of heaven, I found this very interesting. When I looked in the Strong's and studied it out, it was a voice among them. Everlasting gospel, we know, a salvation by grace through faith in the atoning sacrifice of Christ. Ephesians 2.8 says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, is there absolutely nothing that we need to do to get this? Nothing at all. Is there? Well, you know, it's a free gift. You have the option to accept it or to reject it. So there is something you have to do. You have to accept it. Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Come to repentance. That's what you need to be doing. That's what we need to do to get this free gift. Accepting salvation requires repentance. Acts 4.11, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So we understand that there is no everlasting gospel without Christ. That's the everlasting gospel. Nation. Nation translates to a race, a tribe, and this was interesting, specifically foreign, non-Jewish, one usually by implication pagan, Gentile, or heathen. I found that interesting considering what happened in 34 AD with the stoning of Stephen, wherein the Jews had 490 years to get themselves to be that light upon the world that God wanted them to be, the messengers to spread that gospel. And they stoned Stephen and, and passed up the opportunity. And the disciples were commanded then to bring that to the Gentiles, to bring that gospel to the Gentiles. And so it's interesting that nation is mentioned first in this in this verse, and it means non-Jewish. Kindred, an offshoot, i.e. race or clan, tribe. Tongue is language, people is people in general. So what this says is every nation, every non-Jew, every kindred, offshoot, race of such, every tongue, every language, and then this ends with every person. So it starts with the message going out to the Gentiles, and then comes right back around the message going out to absolutely everybody. God does not want anyone to not be saved. Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So let's recap 
verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. I saw a messenger being a voice among them, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, preaching salvation by grace through faith in the atoning sacrifice of Christ. To every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, to absolutely everyone. Amen. I'm getting ahead of myself. How do I back this up? Back y'all. Thank you. Remembering the Sabbath is true worship of the God of creation. The seven day Sabbath was blessed at creation, and this is why every nation, every kindred, every tongue, and every people are called to worship the Creator. Nobody is excluded from that because everybody is a product of that. Everyone is a product of creation. So, Sabbath is a memorial of creation. Solomon summed this up nicely when he said in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. For God, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Verse 7, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Loud voice. Loud voice note denotes urgency. Let me give you a little background so you understand loud voice. Many of you know I was a member of the Boston Fire Department. And in that capacity, I, I, attain, I attained the rank of lieutenant. And what that means is uh, I had subordinates and I had superiors. And in dealing with subordinates, they didn't ever give any training. You had to figure this out for yourself. And when you deal with people, you're dealing with adult men and women, you gotta talk to them in a respectful way, even though you're in charge, but you gotta you gotta be respectful. You gotta talk with some, you know, discuss with some authority, but you have to, it's a certain way you, you deal with people because we're all we're all adults there. But when that tone goes off and we head out to a call and we get there and there's a building fire, fire is blowing out the side of the house, people are outside, people are screaming, it's pandemonium and chaos. The loud voice is important. Then I have to use my loud voice because it's urgent, okay? An order not given could be the death of somebody. An order not heard could be the death of somebody. So the loud voice becomes very important because you have to be heard because things have to go a certain way for all of us to get home safe and put that fire out. So loud voice could be the difference between life and death and so it is here in verse seven, and it will be again, and we'll go over that when I get to it. Fear God. To fear God is not to cower in a corner afraid like he's a boogeyman or a Sasquatch or something. Fear means to respect exceedingly, to be in awe. Glory, glory translates to honor and to magnify. So how do you honor God? How do we honor? When you look here in an earthly sense and take, for example, Japanese culture, which was all about honor. They had the way of the Bushido and the Samurais and what have you. What, for, that, for them, what it was was an adherence to a, a, a standard of conduct, a way to carry yourself. And so it is here that we honor God by adhering to a standard of conduct. That standard of conduct we find here in the Word of God. We obey the Word of God, and that's how we honor God. How do you magnify God? When we speaking about Christ is a way to do it. We can go out and we talk to people about Christ and that magnifies when we're talking about it. A better way would be letting Christ shine through you. When Christ lives in us, he will be revealed through us. A righteous life magnifies God. We can't talk about it. We have to be about it and live it. First Corinthians 10 31, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do everything. And I mean everything, adhering to the standard of conduct found in the Bible. The hour of judgment. We are in the hour of judgment. The hour of judgment began in 1844. We're in that hour now. This is why there is such urgency 
with the loud voice. Worship. Now I have in my notes, I don't know why, but I thought this was interesting. The Greek word for worship is proskunio. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but that's what it says. It means to prostrate oneself in homage to, do reverence to, adore. So what does Jesus say about loving him? That's what adore means, is to love. John 14, 15, if ye love me, keep my commandments. John 15, 10, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Worship him who? Well, it says him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water, the creator. God's claim to being God is creation. God created the heaven and the earth in six days, as seen in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, 1 through 3. I'll say it again. God's claim to being God is creation. He's the only one that did it. God, Jesus, created the heaven and the earth in six days. Jesus, the creator. A lot of folks don't know that. I'm very surprised that people don't don't know that when that's in the word of God. But we'll go over it real quick. I don't want to digress. But John 1, 3, all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made talking about the word john 1 10 he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not john 1 14 and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth so here we have in the bible telling us exactly who created the heavens and the earth. Where in loving and obeying God do we find his claim to being the creator? We find that in Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Verse 9, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. And, you know, we come here every Sabbath and we observe Sabbath. And we have to also remember that verse 9 is also a command for the other six days to work. And the Lord's been fulfilling that in my life recently, but I won't get into that. 10, for the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle. God wants you to rest your animals. Sounds pretty serious. Nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Now, a stranger in this sense was anyone that was a non-Jew. There are people that say that the commandments don't apply, but clearly it does. Verse 11, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all of them, and all in them that is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So let's recap verse 7. Saying with a loud voice, with urgency, fear God, respect exceedingly, and give glory to him, honor and magnify. For the hour of judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Why is that a life and death situation, to use a loud voice? Because the hour of judgment has come, and this verse is telling you to choose life. Verse 8. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Babylon. Babylon has a couple applications here. Ancient Babylon and mystery Babylon. We'll do a quick comparison. Both call for false worship. In ancient Babylon, we had Daniel, Mishael, Azariah, and Hananiah staying faithful. And I want you to take heed of the numbers. That was four out of Babylon. There were eight out of the flood. There were three out of Sodom, Gomorrah, Admar, and Zeboim. That's in Deuteronomy 29, 23. You mentioned Sodom and Gomorrah and forget there were more than just those two cities. So there's a message here that the Lord is showing us. And what we should understand is we should seek to be among the faithful few in these last days. That pattern will not change. It will always be few in comparison to the very, very many. We see the Nebuchadnezzar statue in Daniel 2. We see in that statue that uh, Babylon is the head of gold and Medo-Persia the 
the, the chest and arms of silver, uh, Greece, the stomach of brass, Rome, the legs of iron, and the papacy, iron mixed with clay. Now, I think it's interesting that each age that's shown in that statue primarily used that corresponding material. Remember that Nebuchadnezzar decided he didn't want to accept what he was being told in that dream and made that whole statue of gold head to toe. Gold was very prevalent in the day of Babylon. Medial Persia, uh, silver, I don't know, I hate to reference any, any film, so I won't, but there was a certain film that the elite warriors of Medial Persia would show up and they had their silver armor. Greece, we have brass. Now, we understand that Greece was the Bronze Age. They used a lot of bronze. But little science fact here, brass is copper and zinc, and bronze is copper and tin. They're almost the same except for that little bit. Rome, they used iron, iron weapons. And the papacy, the time of the, the feet, the iron mixed with clay. Do we mix iron with clay today? Do we see an application there? How about the industrial age when we decided to take iron rebar and put it into cement? Very interesting. Notice also in the feet that the influence of Rome is all through the remaining divided kingdoms. It also represents a time of the union of church and state. We also, we see also in this statue represents as beasts in Daniel 7, with the fourth beast having attributes of the preceding beasts, as seen in Revelation 13, 2. And the feet then correspond to a time of the little horn, which is the papacy. So ancient Babylon fell in 539 BC, but when does the head in the dream actually fall? You remember this, this dream that, that never had? When does the head of gold actually hit the ground? What happens? Anybody remember? It's not till after the stone that was cut out without hands hits the feet. And so that's the second return of Christ there is talking about. That's in Daniel 2.34. Which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. That stone hit those feet. That's when the head actually touched the ground. Daniel 2.35 then references the third coming of Christ when it says, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. I was very surprised the Lord showed me that application in Daniel of both the second and third coming. That great city, we look at ancient Babylon, we see in Jeremiah 51.7, Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. We look at mystery Babylon. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Parallels already. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. I want you to remember that in the back of your mind. We're going to come back to that. Purple and scarlet, scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having, oh look, again, a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. So this beast power we see in Revelation 13, 2, and Daniel 7, 7, which rests in the feet of the statue of Daniel 2, 33, will fall to the power of the creator. Amen. But why? Because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. See, when the world falls under the beast's power, when all nations enforce the mark, all nations would have drunk the wine of the wrath of Babylon's unfaithfulness. So, let's recap verse 8. And there followed another angel, another messenger, saying, Babylon is fallen is fallen. It says it twice. We understand Babylon, ancient Babylon fell. We understand also that mystery Babylon will also fall. That great city, they both had that golden cup and made the nations drunk because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Verse 9, and the Lord and the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, now there it is again, that loud voice. If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. So we already went over how the loud voice denotes urgency. So this here is another life or death situation. The first time we saw the loud voice, it was pointing us to choose life. 
This time it's telling us what happens to get death. So who is the beast? Revelation 13, 1 through 8. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat in great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name in his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war at the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. I can't, this thing is blocking me again. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of the life, book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So this, this Revelation 13 mentions blasphemy three times. Three times in 13.1, 13.5, and 13.6. So going by Bible principles of the Bible defining the Bible, how, does, what is blas- how is blasphemy defined in the Bible? Mark 2.7, why, why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Luke 5.21, and the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? John 10, 33, the Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou being a man, makest thyself God. So the Bible tells us that making oneself God and ascribing to oneself an action only God can perform, forgiveness of sins, is blasphemy. So now the question, what religious entity today makes such claims? Who claims that they can forgive sins? The papacy. And I told you to remember that uh, the scarlet and purple. And this is the reason why. The Bible is very clear. It makes no mistake about who and what we're dealing with. Remember, the beast is given power from the dragon. Revelation 13, 2. And the dragon shall give him his power and his seat and his authority. So his power is coming from the dragon. So who is the dragon? Now, I know you went over this in Sabbath school today. I was in the back listening, but it bears going over again. Revelation 12, 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Revelation 20, verse 2. And he laid hold upon the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. The Bible makes it clear the dragon we're speaking of is none other than Satan himself. Now, what's the image? The image is a union of church and state in homage to the papacy. Ellen White says in Great Controversy 40, 440, page 443.1, but what is the image of the beast and how is it to be formed? The image is made by the two-horned beast and is an image of the first beast. It is also called an image of the beast. Then to learn what the image is, like and how it is to be how it is to be formed, we must study the characteristics of the beast itself, the papacy. She goes on to say, when the early church became corrupt, corrupted by departing from the simplicity of the gospel and accepting heathen rites and customs, she lost the spirit and power of God. And in order to control the consciousness of, of the people, she sought the support of the secular power. The result was the papacy, a church that controlled the power of the state and employed it to further her own ends especially for the punishment of heresy. In order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends. Great Controversy 443.2. So where do we find the USA in the Bible? Not in the Revelation 13, 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, 
and spake as a dragon. Understanding, we talk about Bible prophecy, when a nation comes up out of the earth, it comes up, the earth represents a place mostly barren, devoid of life. It's very sparsely populated, and as it's coming from the sea, it's very densely populated. So this is telling us that there's a nation going to come up from a place that was not very densely populated and had two horns like a lamb. We understand that this nation was founded on godly principles. In God we trust. That's how we started. But later it will speak as a dragon. And a nation speaks through legislations. But in this case, it will also abandon Christian principles in favor of a satanic agenda. We are fast approaching that time. We are in that time. When the leading churches of the United States, uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decree and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result. Great Controversy 445.1. Remember, Mystery Babylon is the mother of harlots. The Bible advocates Sabbath, the papacy advocates Sunday. Protestant churches today keep what day? They keep Sunday. The observance of Sunday as a holy day can only occur in recognition of the Vatican authority. The Vatican claims it is the mother church. This makes all of the churches following her power, those harlots the Bible speaks about. So what is the mark? Sunday observance enforced by law. It's a simple definition. We'll get a little deeper. But Christians of past generations observed the, sun, the Sunday, supposing that in so doing they were keeping the Bible Sabbath. And they are now true Christians in every church, not expecting the Roman Catholic communion, who honestly believe, not accepting, I'm sorry, the Roman Catholic communion, who honestly believe that Sunday is the Sabbath of divine appointment. God accepts their sincerity of purpose and their integrity before him. When Sunday observance shall be enforced by law and the world shall be enlightened concerning the obligation of the true Sabbath, then whoever shall transgress the command of God to obey a precept which has no higher authority than that of Rome will thereby honor, honor property above God. He is paying homage to Rome and to the power which enforces the institution ordained by Rome. He is worshiping the beast in his image. As men then reject the institution which God has declared to be the sign of his authority, and honor in its stead that which Rome has chosen as the token of her supremacy, they will thereby accept the sign of allegiance to Rome, the mark of the beast. And it is not until the issue is thus plainly set before the people that they are brought to and they that and they are brought to choose between the commandments of God and the commandments of men that those who continue in transgression will receive the mark of the beast. Great Controversy 449.1. And the important part of that, well, it's all important, but the part I want to highlight is it says, not until the issue is thus plainly set before the people and they are brought to choose between the commandments of God and the commandments of men. See, God holds you accountable for what you know, okay? When you have the light and you have information, you're held accountable to the light you have, okay? And so... This is important, not just for the world, but for us too, because God is going to hold us as Seventh-day Adventists accountable for the light we have, the information we have. And so we see in the parable of, say, the 10 virgins that all 10 were asleep. And then when the midnight cry happens, the midnight cry being a national Sunday law, they wake up. But five are wise and five are foolish. Why? Well, the five wise virgins were ready. They got themselves ready. The five foolish virgins did not. And they wake up to be lost because they knew what the truth was. And they didn't get ready. I have a lot of conversations with people about coming world events and present day stuff and Mark the Beast and what's happening and how urgent it is to get ready because time is fast approaching. But we have to understand that all such conversations is just presumption. They're nice to talk about, but it's absolute presumption. Why? Because the Bible tells you, choose you this day who you will follow. It doesn't say choose when the mark of the beast happens. It doesn't say choose next week. It doesn't say choose tomorrow. It says choose now. Why choose now? Because your life could end at any single moment. And you must be ready now. 
So the urgency with which I preach about when I give the three angels message is an urgency not based because of prophecy and the three angels message and what's coming. That's all true. But that urgency has always been a part of the word of God. Always. Because it tells you to choose this day. You could walk out that door. and That's the last time you walk out that door. And if you hadn't chosen correctly, well. So we have to understand how important it is that we are being held by God to a higher standard because we have this information that the world does not currently have. And when they get this information, she says right here, when they get this information, they understand between Sabbath and Sunday, the choice they make at that point, they will be held accountable for. When Protestant America abandons the Sabbath through the support of legislation and imposes Sunday observance, it will form an image to the beasts. Sunday observance by law will then become the mark of the beast. God puts his mark and seal in his law, Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment, yes? Satan is going to counterfeit God's mark and seal also by law. In the forehead represents your beliefs or personal convictions, and in your hand denotes by labor and or actions. So we understand that God's mark can only be in your forehead because you must believe and God will not accept empty actions. You can't fool God. You can't go through the motions. God knows your heart. People will take the mark of the beast either because they believe or because they want to maintain their life or their lifestyle. And let's understand that you can't sit here and say, oh, I would never do it. It won't be me. I got news. Not ready. And that loud cry, that, that midnight cry comes, that National Sunday Law passes, and you're not ready. You're not ready. Those five virgins went to the door, and it was shut. And, and this, is, this is very sobering. You got to think about this. When did those five virgins in the application of, of in life now find out that door was shut? Did they know? Will we know while we're living that door is shut? Or you're going to find out. Second resurrection. You go your life thinking you're saved. And Christ wakes you up. You're looking around. And it's not the resurrection you want to be in. That door is shut. Have mercy indeed. And so we have to understand that now is the day we get ready for this. We don't wait. When you look at what's recently happened with COVID, and I want you to understand this too, and what's happened with mask wearing, vaccine mandates. They put people on the line by threatening their jobs. If your job is threatened, your home is threatened, how do you keep your home? How do you provide a roof for your children? How do you feed your family? And they were just talking about wearing masks or getting a shot. And, 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 and they made people do what they wanted them to do. Whether you wanted to or not, people had to weigh their lifestyle and what they was going on. So that's just a small, that's a very tiny, minuscule example of what we're going to be looking at when the mark of the beast comes around. Because they're not going to just threaten your home or threaten your job. They're going to threaten your very existence. They're going to tell you, take this mark or end, we're going to end your life. And you've got to be like the five wise virgins. You've got to be ready. You've got to be settled in Christ, Christ in your heart, to be able to look at them and say, then take my life. Because Christ can pick it up again. <laughs> I am not worried about what you can do. And so when we look at that small example of what recently happened, understand it would be much worse when the mark of the beast comes, okay? I mean, no one came to you and said, you know, take this vaccine shot or wear this mask or we're going to kill you. Yet people took it to keep their, their lifestyle, their homes, their jobs, and their life wasn't even threatened. So you, you, just, you just consider that. So let's, let's recap. And there followed another angel saying, oh, I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. And the third angel followed them. The third messenger followed them saying with a loud voice, urgency, if any man worship the beast, we know worship is to revere and to adore, to love the beast and his image, which is made here in America, and receive his mark, take Sunday by law and choose papacy over Christ or in his hand. 
verse 10 says, And the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. What is the wrath of God? Revelation 15, 1 says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Without mixture means full strength. So the wrath may start with the seven last plagues, but as we see in verse 10, it's going to end in fire and brimstone. Going back to the mark real quick, it says the light that we have upon the third angel's message is the true light. The mark of the beast is exactly what it has been proclaimed to be. All in regard to this matter is not yet understood and will not be understood until the unrolling of the scroll. So what she basically is saying is we know what the mark is, but we can't sit here and say exactly with detail precisely how it's going to come down. We don't need to know that now. We just need to be ready. Then it won't matter how it comes down. And the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. These seven last plagues are going to come. And they're going to come full strength. Into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. Starts with the plagues. It's going to end in fire and brimstone. 11 says, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name, forever and ever. Are folks going to be burning forever and ever? The world at large thinks so. Is God cruel and unjust? Everybody here should be saying no. Is God cruel and unjust? Absolutely, certainly not. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. To be tormented forever would require eternal life. But we understand eternal life is only given to the righteous. So if it's not forever and ever eternally burning, what, what does that mean? It means it's not the process, but it's the result that's eternal. Okay? Isaiah 38, 34, 8. For it, it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. And the streams therefore thereof shall be turned into pitch and the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land therefore shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night or day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. Jude 1, seven. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner are giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth as an, for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal life. Jeremiah 17.27 but if ye will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day and not to bear a burden, even entering in at the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then will I kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Is Edom still burning? No. Is Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding city still burning? No. Is Jerusalem still burning? No. The eternal nature of God's judgment is the fire that cannot be quenched. OK, until it accomplishes its purpose, those stated to burn will do so until they are consumed and gone forever. So to recap 11 and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. They burn until they're out of existence and they have no rest day or night while they're burning. Who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receive, whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. In verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. Now, patience translated into the Strong's as enduring. And faith, was pistis was the Greek word for it, it was assurance and belief. So, here is the enduring of the saints, because we're going to have to endure. Here are they that keep the commandments of God in the assurance and the belief of Jesus. Amen? The three angels' message is great news. I know when we read it, we read all that stuff, and people say, oh, my goodness, fire and brimstone. But no, it's great news. It warns us from eternal damnation 
and points us to our Savior and eternal life. Amen. It ends with the faith of Jesus, reminding us that the focus is not the wrath of God, but the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So I close with the three angels message and hopefully after going through this, it has a deeper meaning now for you than it did before. The angels are calling. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus.